First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I don't really like to talk about me, but uh, hopefully what God's done through me and in spite of me will glorify him. So everybody wants to hear a little bit about my testimony. So let me give you just a little brief snippet about me. I don't like to talk about me. But um, uh, just a little bit of my life. About 17 years ago, I was visiting some people in the hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, driving home, uh, a drunk driver, he's actually on heroin, hit me broadside. I fractured every vertebrae in my neck, fractured my back. And uh, God was good. I was able to walk. Within a couple of years, I was on morphine. Uh, for the last approximately 10 years, I've had an implanted morphine pump that uh, goes right in my spinal column, implanted right here, and uh, takes care of the pain that would cripple me and pretty much did cripple me. Um, I thought it couldn't get worse than that, but uh, it can. Um, my wife became terminally ill while I was dean of the seminary. Um, you know, she actually passed away four years ago. Even came to the point of saying, you know, uh, you know, I'm supposed to have all the answers, yeah? And I've counseled people going through a lot of bad experiences. And, and I even came to the point of saying, you know what, maybe this whole thing about God's not even real. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but you know what, that's the truth. I just came to that point. I mean, I'm the dean of the seminary, you know? But I said, hey, I, I see God over, working over here for these people and those people, you know, but, but God's not done anything for me. I mean, y'all God saved me, but, you know, man, just get that point in time when it gets bad enough. And, um, you know, but, but fortunately my brain, I guess, overcame my heart because my heart was telling me that, that God didn't love me anymore. And, um, you know, but I said, you know what, but it's okay. I know God's real, and I know he loves me even though it doesn't feel like it. My wife passed away two and a half years ago. I uh, left me two teenage daughters. I raised them for a couple years, and then uh, two years ago, be two years ago, this is Valentine's Day, my 20-year-old daughter was killed in a car wreck. And um, praise God, I still have my one daughter. I'm thankful for that. Last summer, I said, it can't get worse. Don't ever say it can't get worse. Then last summer, my body, I, I got sick. I didn't know what was wrong with my body. For 10 days, I was sick. I couldn't even get my head up off the pillow hardly. I, I actually canceled a, p a speaking engagement, which I've never done. I've only done it once in my life. And um, I, I, I lost 30 pounds in 10 days. And finally, after the 10th day, I said, you know what? I'm going to church today. No matter what happens, I'm going to church if it kills me. So I got up. I was trying, trying to get ready for church. I noticed something shiny out of the corner of mine. I looked down. It was my implant of morphine pump coming through my skin. My body was rejecting my pump. I said, I'm not a medical doctor, but I don't think this is good. So, you know, went to the hospital. They said, we don't know what to do with this. They sent me back to my, my doctor. He said, I don't know what to do with this. I said, what do I do, doc? He said, there's one other man in the state that puts these pumps in. So I'll send you to him. I went to him. I said, have you ever seen this before? He said, I've seen it one time. He said, we'll put you in the hospital right now. I, didn't, I never left his office. went straight to my room, hooked me up with, I mean, I was, my body was filled full of infection. I was in bad shape. And um, they said, we're going to have to wean you off the morphine pump. If we turn it off, it'll kill you. I was on a, the pump only goes to 50 because 50 will kill you. And I was in the, I think, 40s, somewhere in the 40s when they took it. Uh, had this problem and, uh, coming out and everything. And um, so we'll have to put you in the hospital for a week, wean you off of it every day. Uh, get to the end of the week, get to Friday, we'll take the pump out. We'll just run morphine through your IVs. We'll keep you comfortable. And... Um, We'll put a new one on the other side later. I began to cry. I said, you can't. You can't even turn it down. I'll die. I already know this. We've tried it. He said, we'll keep you comfortable. So they ran a lot of morphine through my IVs. <laughs> it was a rough week. And they came in every day, turned it down a little bit, came in Thursday, turned it down uh, almost completely off, filled me completely full of morphine. I fell asleep, passed out, whatever you want to call it. And I remember distinctly, that was at 6 o'clock in the morning. At 11 o'clock, I sat straight up in bed. I just opened my eyes and sat straight up in bed. I thought I was dead. I said, I felt so weird. My body felt so weird. I said, what's wrong with my body? I started my feet. My, my toes were fine. My feet were fine. My legs were fine. I worked all the way up to the top of my head. When I got to the top of my head, I started to cry because I realized for the first time in 17 years, the pain that crippled me was just gone like that. You know, that's, that's God. That's God. And I got my personal miracle. 
and I know God loves me very much. And if I ever begin to doubt, and this is honest truth, this is what I do. If I begin to wonder if God's in control, begin to wonder if God's good, I just reach down right here where I still got the scar tissue. Yep, that pump's still gone. Praise God. And the pain's completely gone. Someone, I have people come to me still and say, so how much morphine are you on? I say, none. They say, that's impossible. Well, how much, what pain medicine are you taking? I said, none. They said, that they can't, that's impossible. I said, that's why they call it a miracle. Okay. It's the honest truth. That's what God's done. I actually had a blessing. A uh, uh, couple that was, I was their pastor for a few years up in Indiana. I just found out early last week they are living in Fort Worth. Barry and I stopped to see them on the way from the airport. Such a blessing to see them. And uh, you can ask Barry. They were telling Barry they couldn't believe it because they knew me. They knew the pain I was in. And they couldn't, absolutely couldn't believe it. They reminded me. They are telling me how bad it was. And I'm like, was I really that bad? Yeah, yeah, I guess I was that bad. So uh, God's amazing. So you ever begin to wonder if, if God's in control or wonder if God loves you? Just remember what God can do. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. I want to say before I begin this evening, in everything we do, our number one purpose is to reach loss with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're here this evening and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you don't know the God that can do awesome things for you, he did awesome things for me. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, we want to invite you this evening to come know him and Savior. I'll tell you. Bishop Larson will be glad to tell you how to know Jesus Christ, your Savior. That's primary and foremost and first in all that we do in our work in Israel. We also, our job is to edify believers, edify Christians. We want to strengthen you and encourage you in your faith. We're not just digging up dry, dusty rocks for the fun of it. Uh, we're doing this to, to lead people to Jesus Christ and to honor and glorify God. It's not about me. It's not about Bishop Larson. It's not about Moshe or my partner in California, Rick. It's not about any of us. It's about God. And we don't want any man to get in the way of God's glory. Let me tell you a little bit about our, our team, and then we'll begin uh, with, with some slides, and I'll show you what God's doing in the land of Israel. Uh, the, the core part of the team is, is three of us. We've got a huge team now, a lot of people working and helping us and sacrificing incredibly because they believe in this. Uh, the core part starts with three of us. Um, you know a little bit about me now. Um, my partner in this, Rick Ham, he and his family live in Northern California. Uh, Rick sold his aerospace manufacturing business and when he was 37, retired. He's my age. Uh, he's given almost everything he has to ministry. He just, I think he looks for ways to give away money. And uh, he's only, he's given it all like Rick, you can't keep giving it away, you know, and, and he's given it all away. But uh, he just loves the Lord dearly. And just, he actually sold his business and got even though he's making amazing money. Uh, his company made parts for for the military, then for Boeing, and then for NASA. Uh, he made uh, many of the parts on the space shuttles, on the satellites still in space today. He made many of those parts. He gave all that up to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his passion. Uh, the third person of the, the core part of the team is Moshe Bronstein. I think he's in a few of these slides. You just saw him in the video. Uh, Moshe has been, is obviously Israeli, by the way. He is Jew, grew up Orthodox Jew. He is a Christian. He is a believer in Jesus Christ. And he loves, loves Jesus Christ dearly and the Lord dearly. So we have a very rare opportunity. Uh, Moshe is Israel. He grew up in Israel. He knows Israel like the back of his hand. He knows everybody in Israel. Um, Moshe uh, has spent most of his life in archaeology. He's able to unlock doors, get us in accesses and places that's unthinkable that no one else can get into. He does that for us in our groups. And you'll see in some of the slides in the pictures this evening, uh, so you'll see, I think I've got one slide loaded of our group. There's nobody else there but just us. That's because nobody else can get in. Uh, God's amazing. And we try to make that available to anyone that wants to go with his experience. You can ask Bishop, you were at Mount Sinai, weren't you? Yes, Mount Carcombe. Um, you can ask him. He was there as well. Not not with my group, but he's there at a different time. Uh, we do these things. We got the slides for this evening. Ah, hey, I can sit up there. Cool. Uh, let's start here. I always like to start with the known. Uh, we didn't do this, no. Uh, what's this? The Dome of the Rock, okay? Suppose the location of the temple, the Solomon's Temple. Actually, it's just a hair off from there, but it's, it's close. It's close. Um, obviously, this is uh, part of the world that everybody wants. Matter of fact, this one piece 
is the piece that everybody wants, the most valued land in the world. Everything functions around the temple. Now, what I'm going to speak about this evening is not just dry rocks and dust and sand. What we're going to talk about this evening are some of the finds that we directly are involved with uh, that deal with prophecy, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me just give you a tip before we start. If you've been waiting for the return of the Messiah, my friends, we're there. It's happening now, okay? Um, let's go down from the temple just to here. We see in the next slide. Uh, oh, a couple of others. Let me start the Bible. You know, we, we say when we see the temple being rebuilt, we'll know the return of the Messiah is near. I say no. When we see the substructures to the temple being rebuilt, we'll know the return of the Messiah is near. Christ says in Matthew 16, 2, he answers some of them, um, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red in the morning. It'll be foul weather today for the sky is, is red and lowering. You hypocrites, uh, you can discern the, the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Christ is saying, you can tell the weather, yeah? You know, we, we got a saying, my, my parents were from Kentucky, and uh, they had a saying down in Kentucky. It said, red in the morning, sailors take warning. Yes. And red at night, sailors... Okay, you guys heard it too? Is it yeah. true, true down here too as it is in Kentucky? Okay. We can read the weather, right? Christ says, why can't you read the signs of the times? Growing up, I was always taught, you, you can't know. No man knows the day or the hour, which is still true. No man knows the day or the hour, only the Father. But he said, you know, I was always taught, just, just be ready. Christ says, always be ready. But when you see the signs, buckle your seatbelts, pack your suitcase, because you know what? We're there. <laughs> Christ also says in 1 Thessalonians 5, or God says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, but the times and seasons, brother, you have no need that I write unto you. He says, you're children of the day. You're children of the light. You, you understand this stuff. You get it. I don't have to tell you when the signs are because you know what? You'll know. What I want to share with you, my friends, this evening is some of the signs, I believe, of the return of the Messiah. Some of the things that are going to have to happen, we understand from prophecy, these things will happen uh, before the Messiah returns. And my friends, for the first time in 2,000 years, they're happening. Okay? Let's go to uh, the Pool of Siloam. How many has been to Israel? Any? Oh, awesome. Really? That's awesome. I, think, I don't think I've ever had that many. I've one group I spoke to been to Israel. It's amazing. Okay, if you went before 2005 and you went to the Pool of Siloam, you probably went to the Byzantine Pool. Okay. Had that there for years. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Uh, that is marked by letter A. And you see here, this is, here's the Temple Mount again. Uh, the walls around the city of Jerusalem, of course, the retaining wall, what I call the retaining wall for the Temple Mount. Uh, this is Ir David. That's Hebrew for City of David, right here. Um, this is what we do, but, and I'll show you how this is developed. The City of David. So when David took Jerusalem from the Jebusites, first thing he did was, one of the first things, was build this part here where he built his palace approximately right here and we have the pool of siloam the gihon spring and all that which obviously pool of siloam came after david's time uh if you went again before 2005 you went to the pool of siloam you probably went to the letter a which is the byzantine pool that's not the pool of siloam from christ's time uh just down a little bit the hill is where we have letter b the pool of siloam from christ's time now what we have here we'll see in the next slide is um this is the byzantine pool um, but by the way, we, we, we know the pool of Siloam from the Bible, right? Because there Christ healed a man born. Talk to me. Man born. Thank you. And we, we say, okay, that was cool. It was a cool place to go get a drink of water, wash it. No, 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 no. Hang on. Most people don't realize the pool of Siloam isn't just a place that contained water. The pool of Siloam is the world's largest mikvah. Say that with me, mikvah. Ah, uh, now you're speaking in tongues. That's Hebrew, okay? Um, mikvah is a ritual bath. So before a pilgrim could go, uh, you know, a Jew could go to the temple to worship, they first had to wash in the pool of Siloam and be considered clean. You with me? Okay. 
So during festival days like Pesach, Passover, you'd have approximately a million Jews in and out of that pool in a week. Let me ask you a question. Here's one set of steps in and steps out of this pool. How many think it's logistically reasonable and feasible to get a million people in and out of this in a week? Anybody want to take? No, I don't think so. Hold on to that. Let's go to the next slide. This is water in the Gihon Spring. Jewish law is you have to wash in pure living water. Haimaim is the words they use, uh, which is living water or water flowing from a spring. The only natural spring in Jerusalem is the Gihon Spring. And here's where Gihon Spring sources underground, 300 feet directly underneath the Holy of Holies. You with me? Okay. Uh, it flows through Hezekiah's tunnel. Hezekiah built, you know the story, uh, built it in three months, dug uh, about what, 600 feet through solid rock. And uh, we know how they, did, how they did that because they inscribed it in the wall. We know the whole story called Hezekiah's tunnel. So the water from the Gihon Spring flows through Hezekiah's tunnel into the pool of Siloam. With me? Uh, we'll see here in the next slide. Here's Hezekiah's tunnel. Matter of fact, the man in the red shirt is Rick Ham, my partner in California. Just an amazing guy, the one that uh, sold his business just to go into ministry. Here's team, his team that he assembled. Here they are digging out Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, we'll see in the next slide. Here's another picture of uh, Hezekiah's tunnel. Uh, by the way, Jeffrey, you're going to have to stop me when it's time to stop. I'll talk all night. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I might be able to talk. <laughs> I'll try to keep an eye on it. But um, we know how they dug. How did they dig this tunnel? Start at two ends. And the two groups with pickaxes digging through solid rock meet in the middle. How did they do that and still get it to go downhill so the water would flow? Well, we know how they told us. See the black stripe in the rock? Okay. They wrote, we followed the rock strata. They went about three feet below that, started each end, and followed the rock strata. That's how they knew it was level. Pretty ingenious, huh? Uh, this is Hezekiah's tunnel. See the water in it? Um, my partner Rick Ham in that picture that you saw previously, that was Rick opening Hezekiah's tunnel, my friends. For the first time since 70 A.D., water is now flowing from the Gihon Spring once again through Hezekiah's tunnel. Okay. That has to happen before the rebuilding of the temple, before the Messiah will return. Okay. We'll go on the next slide. See here uh, these interesting pictures. The uh, story goes a little bit like this. See, see, this is a street here, and this is a drainage ditch on the side of the street. Okay, and in Israel, whenever they dig anywhere with with anything, they have to have an on-site archaeologist, okay, a guy from the Israel Antiquities Authority. I'll say IAA because that's easier than saying Israel Antiquities Authorities. And so Eli Shukrun's the on-site archaeologist. They were repairing this sewer pipe right here with the backhoes, and they hit a rock, a very large rock in this area. Ellie had been studying this area, and when they hit this large rock, Ellie said, stop, stop the backhoes. He said, I think we just hit the steps to the pool of Siloam from Christ's time. They said, you're crazy. So he goes to his bosses at Israel Antiquities Authorities and says, I think we just found the steps to the ancient pool of Siloam from Christ's time. They said, you're crazy. <laughs> You've got a short time. For a permit, fix a sewer pipe, get it done, get out of there. Ellie calls Moshe. Moshe calls Dr. Ball. Dr. Ball calls Rick. Says, how fast can you get a team over here? Rick assembles team. Gets over there. And it, it, within a very short time, it looks something like I actually found out this picture is from almost a year later. But in a short time, they went from having this to this. That's what we do. Then... Ellie goes back to his boss as Israel Antiquities Authority and says, I think we have the steps to the ancient pool of Siloam. They said, you know, we think you've got something. And now we have, again, we don't have the whole pool dug out. We've got it here. Um, and uh, we, we have this site uh, ready to go. This has to happen before you can have temple worship. Our friends, we have it for the first time in almost 2,000 years. Uh, here's a picture. That's actually Ellie's back there. This is, again, I'm a terrible photographer. This is my picture. This is Moshe. Uh, this is Ellie Shukrin, the arche on-site archaeologist. By the, by the way, Ellie was in the news uh, right before Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving. Anybody see it? See it? Yeah. Um, remember they found an, a coin in the western wall of the temple where the tunnel comes into? A anybody see that? A few of you did? Okay. That's Ellie. Ellie right there. Ellie Shukrin. You read it, we'd say Eli, but it, he pronounces it Ellie, Ellie Shukrun. Uh, and that's part of our work. 
he uh, finished the Alfel. I'll show you in a little bit the, the ascent of the temple uh, where it comes out under Robinson's Arch. And there he found a coin in the wall. They used to put coins between the stones to date the building. You know, like we, we go out and we scratch in the concrete in 1957 or what, you know, whatever. Uh, that's what they did. They put the coin in there. And so there at Herod's Temple, we call it Herod's Temple because Herod did the last revamp of it. Uh, guess what we found out? It's not Herod's Temple. Herod didn't build it. He couldn't have. The coin was in the foundation stones and the coin was after Herod died. Herod may have started, so, so we're learning new stuff every day. Okay, that, that's, that's Ellie. You see here the water from the Gihon Spring. We're containing it here at the top and pumping it out, but the water would naturally flow down the steps. See, see the black pipe? Remember the drainage ditch I showed you they, they were repairing? That's it right there. The street was up here. Okay, that's all completely gone. These are the steps going down to the Pool of Siloam. See in the next slide, uh, this is around the side of the pool. Uh, the steel beams here are holding up the road that is over our heads. Um, again, none of this was there when we started. Ellie found this in 2004. Okay, none of this was here when we started. This was all dirt, underground, etc. None of this was here. Uh, next slide, this is an artist rendition, but I like to throw this slide in because this is cool. Remember the steps we sh I showed you dug out? This would be those steps. Again, this is an artist's rendition. So the pool of Siloam from Christ's time is approximately one acre in size. Now let's take another vote. How many think it's feasible to get a million people in and out of this pool in a week? Make sense? Okay, this is what we have. A couple other features of the pool here. Uh, this is the Offel. Or the ascent, Alphel is Hebrew for ascent, ascent up to the temple. So when a uh, Jew would come to worship, they would wash in the pool, be considered ceremonially clean. They were clean. I mean, it's, it's simple. You know, God said, hey. You know, we look at all the Jewish laws and we say, oh, so many laws, they don't make any sense. They're so confusing. They're simple, guys. It's real easy. You know, and God said, before you go to the temple, take a bath. Okay. Before you go to church, take a bath. Yeah, God deserves our best, does he not? Yes. So this is the Ophel. This is the clean side. Okay? So these steps, the large marble slabs, uh, in their day they were fit so tight you, you could barely fit a razor blade between them if you could do that. Okay? Um, this is the ascent of the temple. I could talk on that, so I'm selecting my words carefully. Uh, and again, this is what was in the news where Ellie finished this, where it comes out by the Temple Mount. Again, none of this was there when our team started, and we've helped Ellie on this some. Uh, this is part of what we do. Uh, I closer up shot here, the steps, again, the marble steps, and they're very tight. So this is the clean side. I'm telling you all this for a reason. Uh, by the way, um, I, I don't have it in this slide deck, but there's a step right below here. There's a couple steps that are broken. Okay, the step is actually broken off, and they had to take wood and lay over it to finish it out so people wouldn't trip on it. Interesting story behind that broken step or those broken steps. There's a couple of them. Do you remember seeing them, brother? Okay. Underneath these steps, there's a tunnel, a sacred holy tunnel that drained off the ashes from the sacrifices in the temple. And in 70 AD, when Rome was sacking the temple, the last few Jews that held up in the temple trying to protect this holy place, they said, hey, we got to get out or we're dead. And they knew of a way out, only one way out. They actually snuck down this tunnel. The Romans heard them but couldn't find them. When they saw them coming out of the tunnel down the Kidron Valley, they realized, hey, there's a tunnel under these steps. They took logs, broke holes in the steps, and poured boiling oil on these Jews, and they all died in that tunnel. God, actually, God was good. Me and I think six other guys had the rare privilege of doing some excavation work in that tunnel. Uh, once the Jews found out where they were in there, we were the only Gentiles ever in there because once the Jews found out, said, this is sacred, this is holy, and it is. We didn't know what we were doing. We just said, told the dig, so we dug. Um, just, just amazing, okay? Uh, next slide. This is the decent side. This is, so before you were considered clean, before you were washed, you'd come down this side and somehow I got in this picture I'm checking my text messages over there um, and there would be shops all along here and again the steel beams are holding up the road literally the road 
the road's right here. This is the road. There's still a plate there, and that's the road. Uh, holding it up over our heads, and there'll be shops all along the sides of these in Christ's time. I showed, I told you all that for a reason. Watch. The next slide, we'll see something. I'll show you something. And I'm not going to talk about it real long, but I'll give you a few details because hopefully this will be a blessing to you. This area here is about 10 foot by 10 foot. Okay. Now, if you remember the picture where we had the, the mural, you know, the, the artist's rendition of what the pool looked like, the picture before that uh, was the court around the side. Okay. That's the unclean side. And then after you turn this corner, it becomes the clean side. Now, let's go to John chapter 9 for just a second. You all know the story, right? Man was sitting there born blind. Why was he at the pool of Siloam? Why, was in, why would anybody go to the pool of Siloam? Not healed. They wanted to get clean. Now, there were a lot of healings took place there, Okay. He wanted to be clean. He went to the pool every day. He, all he wanted to do was, was go worship God. You with me? See his heart? He just wanted to worship God. And Jewish law, not God's law, Jewish law said if you're lame, blind, or have a crooked nose, it's honest truth. It's, it's honest truth. You can't go to the temple to worship. Now, that's not what God said, is it? What God say? God said in Deuteronomy, if you're lame, blind, or have a crooked nose, it's in there, look it up, okay, that you can't be a priest. He didn't say you couldn't go worship. The Jews took God's law and expanded on it. says, well, you can't even go to the temple to worship. That's not what God said. That was man's law. So for him to get in this pool meant immediate death. They would have killed him. They said, you can never be clean because you're not good enough. That's not true, is it? My friends, if God, can, if God can save a sinner like me, he can save anybody. He will, and he wants to. Don't ever think you're above somebody else because you're not. We're all just sinners. My friends, if you look up here, there's anything good in me, it's not me. Trust me. It, if you see anything good here, give God the glory. It's him. It's not me. You look up here and see something bad? Okay, that's me. <laughs> this man, all he wanted to do was go worship. He sat right in this area. Christ came along. And it's like he's... And here's my Indiana farm boy version of this. It's like he said, you know, I, I, I see your heart. It's okay. You go worship. And by the way, that side thing, I'll take care of that too. And he said, go wash in the pool. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. Nobody can give him permission to wash in the pool except, except God. When this man went and washed in the pool, he was stepping on a face so huge. He's saying, I know you are God. And you'll take care of me. And he did, did he not? Now, all of us on the team, we're researchers, and we, we, we're tough. We're tough. We're each other's toughest critics. We're tough on each other. And we came to this area, and, and Rick and I were talking about it, and, and I said, you know what? I got you guys now. You're, you're wrong. It can't be. I said, Rick, if this is the place where Christ told the man born blind, where's the dirt? He said, I'm sorry? I said, where's the dirt? Remember, Christ spat on the ground and made clay out of the spittle. Where's the dirt? And Rick said, Right there, just like on the ground now, just the dirt off of our feet. And I thought about that, and I thought, and I said, wow, isn't that just like God? He takes our dirt, our leftovers, and our messes. He does something amazing with it, isn't it? God's so good, is he not? You know, just in case you're curious, this stuff has absolutely changed my life for the better. Matter of fact, I don't know of a person that's been over there with, on any of our trips over there, our groups, that has not revolutionized their life. And that's our passion, to change people for Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go on. Uh, th that's brief, briefly, briefly what we do there. Uh, we're down the hill just a little bit here. 
What you're looking at is a very, very important site. This is the burial house of David. I know it's not a great picture here, but this is still part of the city of David. The palace was just over here to the little bit, uh, the palace of David, and uh, the pool of Siloam we looked at. Oh, I keep going to this site. I'm, I'm not ignoring you people over here. Let me come over here for a little bit. Um, and the Kidron Valley all through here. This is the burial house of David, okay? Let me see if I can point it out on here. Uh, well, we're going to go, let me, let me go closer up on another slide. We're going to go right here, okay? Right here. Let's see what the next, the next slide you see. Aha, here we go. It looks like steps, yeah? They're not steps. This is a table. Let me explain. This is the burial house of David, kind of like a funeral home, okay? And in the funeral home, they would, during Christ's time, they would take the, the bones after they, they put them in a tomb for two years, pull them out, dry the bones, put them in a bone box, caught in ossuary. Good. Very good. Ossuary. And they would then often store the ossuaries for the family or house of David in the lower room. Now, if you have a lower room, obviously you also have to have an upper room. The upper room had to be, by Jewish law, nine arms, nine cubits, from the lower room. This is exactly nine cubits from the lower room. This is the upper room where Christ had his last Seder meal with his disciples. What you see here, these guys are actually on the wrong step. They need to be down one. Here's where they put their feet. Here's where they would sit. Here was the table. So it looked like step, step, long step. Step, step, long step. The long step was the table where they put their food. Okay? So when John leaned back upon Christ, it makes sense, does it not? Am I doing something wrong on my mic? Sorry, it's my fault. Um, and by the way, you want to hear something cool? Right here is the head of the table by, by Jewish customs and traditions. Who sat there? Yeah, and when he washed his disciples' feet, he walked right through there. Makes a lot of sense, does it not? So we go to IA with this. They say, we've got three upper rooms. Said, we, we've already got three upper rooms. We don't need another one. But we got the real one. We don't want to upset the Catholics with their upper room. But we got the real one. They said, no, no, no. So we started taking our people there, just our groups. They saw so many people going there. They said, you know what? Maybe you got something. These guys are a little slow sometimes. How do we know this is the real upper Besides it all fits and it all looks good and it's all in the right place. How do we know? In, in archaeology, there's a rule of thumb. Once you find an inscription... You're pretty much done. It's over. Assuming the inscription's authentic, you're done because you know exactly what you have once there's an inscription. And there's not inscriptions very often. We have the inscription. They wrote everything down in, the, in a plaque in the floor of this place. And we even know the name of the keeper of the upper room when Christ was just down the Kidron Valley a little bit. He said to his disciples, hey, go up there. You're going to find a man carrying a pot of water. Of course he was. He's getting ready for, for the... Uh, Seder meal for, for Passover, for Pesach. Of course he would be. It's the right time of day coming from the, the Pool of Siloam. You meet a man there, uh, tell him to book the upper room. I'm coming there to have the last supper with my disciples. The Seder meal, the Passover meal with his disciples. You want to know something really cool? You want to know his name? We know his name. We even know the name of the keeper of the upper room. You want to know his name? Yes. Five of you do? Do you guys want? Yeah. Okay. Just Just checking. <laughs> His name in Greek, because it was written in Greek, is Theodotus. And the Hebrew version is Tudor, from the famous Tudor priestly family. And guess where the priestly family of Tudor did their work, where we found them at? Over the hill in Bethlehem. Pretty cool, huh? Stuff we learn as we go. This is part of what we do. This is another site that we have that we've been working on. Another site, I've got to move quickly because I'm sure I'm about out of time. Um, red heifer sacrifice has to happen to sanctify the temple. Whenever it was time to sanctify or purify the temple, God would send a red heifer to Israel. I always thought, okay, if the temple needed to be sanctified, go find a red heifer. No, 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 no. Only God knew when it needed to be sanctified. God said, hey, you need to cleanse the temple. I'm sending you a red heifer. By Jewish law, the high priest would have to sacrifice the red heifer on a special site. Okay? Take its ashes, mix it with um, uh, myrrh, and, uh, myrrh and frankincense. And uh, what's the one when they dip the... Hyssop. Hyssop, thank you. 
<laughs> Sarah's like, I just couldn't think. And hits it and, and take the ashes of the red heifer, mix it with those spices, uh, herbs, and water from the Gihon Spring. Take this mixture, he'd anoint himself, then his clothes, then his utensils, then he would uh, sanctify the way, the bridge, through the eastern gate, into the temple, and sanctify everything in the temple. Okay? This had to be before you could start temple worship. So when the millennial temple is built and reopened, guess what? Before we can start temple worship, we have to have red heifer sacrifice. There's been nine red heifer sacrifices, sacrifice attempts in history. Seven were successful, two were not. I asked Moshe, I said, well, what happened to two that didn't make it? He, and this is his words. He said, they grew a white spot or something. Okay, so... <laughs> so they go a little white spot. They're not pure red. They're not pure red. So, so uh, seven in history. Five were first temple periods. Two were second temple period. You with me? Yeah. I'm going somewhere. Hang on to this. Two second temple period. Well, the two second temple period are easy. We know when those were. The first is when they established worship in the second temple after they came back from Babylon. Right? Had to be. Guess when the last red heifer sacrifice happened? Anybody know? I heard somebody say it. The year Christ was crucified. Get it? So Christ was not only our Pesach sacrifice, our Paschal lamb, Passover sacrifice. He was not only the scapegoat sacrifice because he was sacrificed outside the walls. He was our red heifer sacrifice. And if you really, we really got serious about it, he, Jesus Christ, is all of our sacrifices in one. Now, from our research and studies, we also know something else from the red heifer sacrifice. We have ancient lithographs. And we, and now, let me back up a second. When we go to looking for a site, we don't start with a site and say, ooh, this is something, let's make it fit. No, we start, we, we start with the research. We have a, a, a premise that we start with in our work, and that is this. The Bible is never, never, never wrong. Amen. Always start with the Bible. Amen. You know, and I've always been frustrated with archaeology because they say, oh, well, the Bible is wrong because we dug this up, and the Bible's no. You got the wrong thing, dude. Okay? And what we're finding, not only are we changing history, everything we find lines up with the Bible exactly every time. You know, what's amazing, sometimes we look at this, it's, it's not the way we thought it was. But we understand, we're like, oh, but this is what God said. It makes sense. It's exactly the way God said it was every single time. Okay? We also know where the Red Heifer Bridge was, the Red Heifer Sacrifice. I'll show you just a second uh, where the, the site was. Uh, by the way, I, I think we have control of that. Now, do we? Is that our site, Red Heifer site? Okay, I, I, I talked to the guys every day, and he asked them. Um, the Red Heifer Bridge came across here, so the high priest would annoy himself. They built a special bridge just for this one occasion, for the pri high priest to walk across and anoint everything. Nobody else used the bridge, okay? And they didn't tear it down. They just let it stay there till it fell down. We even know, and we, we, I've seen it. They're gone now. I've seen the ancient foundations of this bridge. Okay, they were there just a few years ago. We have ancient lithographs. A lithograph is a picture. Okay, it's, a, it's an old, old Polaroid, okay? Um, they would, before they had Polaroid, they would chisel in stone these pictures. It was a very, very, very serious art they did. They got the details just right. The last Red Heifer Bridge came across here above Solomon's tomb, curved around this way, so it entered straight in through the eastern gate. The eastern gate from Christ's time, I gotta have it going one side, is right here. Okay, this eastern gate we see here is uh, from Turkish time. It's not the real eastern gate. The real eastern gate is just a little bit south, right there. Okay, so you notice the eastern gate is closed or it's blocked up with stones, right? Okay. The eastern gate stayed blocked up with stones. It was only open during one time, and it was open the year of the sacrifice of the red heifer. So we read in prophecies, we read in Ezekiel 44 how it's open. When it's open, and guess what? It's the year of the sacrifice of the red heifer. We know from the Mishnah, the Jewish history books, 
that the Roman centurions standing by the cross could see the veil of the temple as it was torn in two from top to bottom, right? Oh, that tells us something. It tells us that the, the, the gates were open. Yeah? They were unblocked. So it was the year of the sacrifice of the red heifer. That's, yeah, the year Christ was crucified. It also tells us where Christ was crucified. See this hill right here? Christ was crucified right here somewhere on this hill right here. Therefore, his tomb had to be, you remember Joseph of Arimathea? Joseph of Arimathea's plot, his uncle, guess where their family plot is? It's in the garden of Gethsemane. Where's the garden of Gethsemane? This is the garden of Gethsemane right here. And Christ was buried just down the hill. We know where Christ's tomb is. It's not open. It's not public. We're Anybody got extra three hundred thousand dollars you can loan us? We can buy it right now for I'm I'm serious, we can. Right down in here, and I really can't show you much more than that. Right down here is where Christ's actual burial tomb was. And what's interesting is in the eighteen hundreds, that was considered the burial tomb of Christ. They had a right. Somehow it got forgotten and lost. Uh, by the way, guess who else was buried just up in the same area? Just just up a little bit from where Christ was buried. Remember he was a preacher? And his preaching and they said, you sound just like that guy we just crucified a few years ago. And if you're one of his, we're going we're gonna to kill you too and bury you with him. And so they took up rocks and they stoned him and his name was? Yeah. And there's a big picture in this church right here and it's all in Greek. And I'm, of course, I go up and I read it. Nobody's going to read it. I'm reading it. And it says, you know, St Stephen the martyr, the holy saint martyr from, you know, from Stephen of Gethsemane. He was from Gethsemane too. And they buried him there too. Said you're going to be his. So, so I, I look at this and I say, you know, okay, I get it. I see it. But you know, when the Red Heifer Bridge was built, who came to Jerusalem the year of the Red Heifer? Everybody. Right? I mean, this is not just a once in a lifetime. This is once in many, many, many lifetimes events. Right? And everybody, was, only the high priest could be on the bridge, but everybody wanted to see it. Why would God allow his son to hang in humiliation in front of the whole world so everybody could see? So that when he rose from the dead, everybody knew it. See in the next slide, next slide. Uh, this is just, if we were in the same position, we're in, just swing the camera around a little bit to the right. There again is where Christ was crucified on this hill. Uh, this is the red heifer site. We don't know. We're down to this area right here. We know it's right in this area somewhere, somewhere is the actual uh, site of the red heifer. Uh, for the first time in 2,000 years, we now have that once again. Okay. And you have to ask the question. You have to ask the question, why now? For such a time as this. Yeah? Okay. Let's go on. A little bit more of what we do. Uh, just quickly, I'm going to go through a few more things of, of what we do. By the way, what do we do? We reconnect God's... Am I doing that again? Sorry. We reconnect God's people with God's land. God's land is special. You know, Texas is good. I like Texas. Okay, I'll try that again. Texas is great. I like Texas. It's nice. It's cold, but it's nice. And it's great land. But you know what? Nothing like this land. This is God's land. God chose this for whom? For his people. Yeah. And if you didn't know it, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you're God's people. We're grafted in, are we not? This is special. There's something sacred, something holy about being there, seeing this, touching this. It will change your life, and I can't even explain it. All I know to do is say, the Spirit of God's there. He's here, but he's really there. <laughs> really, really, really there. This is amazing. Here's one of our groups. Uh, this is our group went last April. Uh, some, some of them are sitting right back here. Um, here we are. This is Mount Carcom. has several names. Uh, Mount Carcom is a modern Arabic name. Mount Carcom, 
uh, Mountain of Fire, Mountain of God, uh, also called the Black Mountain, the Golden Mountain, Mount Horeb, and also well known as Mount Mount Sinai. Yeah, we always say Sinai. That's our, I try to pronounce it the Hebrew way, which is Sinai. Okay? And what happened here? Moses received what? You guys going to sleep on me? Okay, I don't want to put you to sleep. If I do, I may have to exercise the preacher's prerogative. Everybody knows the preacher's prerogative? If I put you to sleep, I have the right to wake you up. Okay? <laughs> Here we are on Mount Sinai. Notice there's nobody else there. It requires the highest military clearance to get in there. We can do that. You can see Bishop's been there. Ask him. Uh, God's amazing. Let me tell you a little bit about Mount Sinai since, since Jeffrey gave me <laughs> another 30 minutes, which I've probably about used up by now. Um, let me tell you a little about this. There's three major sites um, considered for Mount Sinai. There's this site. There's a uh, uh, mountain down south of this a little bit, Santa Canarina. It's a mouthful. Um, that's Latin, I believe. Uh, that's the Catholic Church site, and they have their little building there and everything. And the third site's in Saudi Arabia, Bob Cornuke. Actually, I just was with Bob the other day. Bob's a dear friend of mine. I, we disagree on this, and that's fine. Uh, Bob has uh, Mount Sinai down in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my big problem with that is uh, God says that they walked, that Israel walked from Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barney in 11 days. It's impossible to walk from Saudi Arabia, especially with 3 million people, to Kadesh Barney in 11 days. Just can't be done. Uh, this is certainly that area. Um, a little over a year ago, a year ago this past April now, the Catholic Church published, the Vatican published an article. This, the synopsis of the article was this. They said, we have now come to realize that Mount Carcom is the real Mount Sinai. Do you realize how huge that is? To my knowledge, it's the first time in history the Vatican said, we made a mistake. Okay? And, and we, we, we love the Catholic Church. The Vatican, they're, they're, they're great people. We love them dearly. Uh, they are now in, in, in preparation stage. I mean, they're now building a cathedral here on Mount Sinai. And they're building roads in force and everything. Thank you very much, Catholic Church. Because we had to go back and four-wheel drive vehicles back. There, isn't, there are no roads here. This is the real stuff. This is what we do. We, we take God's people to God's land. Uh, by, the, by the way, let me back up one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Um, just, and I can't spend a lot of time on it. This, from our research and studies, this is the first form of any tab, temple or tabernacle, before the instruction for the tabernacle. This is the first form of a worship center to Jehovah God for the Jews right here. Uh, it's just there. There's no buildings. There's no markers. There's, it's just there. We walked up on this. It's been there. For 3,500 years, still there today. All the stuff I'm going to show you on this site is just laying there on the ground for us to go up and walk. It's just there. It's just there. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is um, this is uh, turned up completely. I don't know. I'm good. I'm good. I'm terrible on these stones. Go turn them up. Uh, this is, again, this, a lot of the stones that are black. It's the iron ore coming out, and the rocks are not burnt rocks. We do have burnt rocks there. This is not one of them. Uh, this is the iron ore coming out. It made almost like a blackboard for them. They took a rock, drew on them. They litter, the, the place is littered with evidence of them being there. Here's one of the things they wrote. In Egyptian hieroglyphics, anybody know Egyptian hieroglyphics? Want to read for me? Okay. I don't either. I just know what it says. Okay. This is a staff. A living staff, because it's got a head on it, okay? A living staff, as a symbol for it became a... Yeah. Who would have written that down? Yeah, let's go on. Uh, what's this? Yes, it is. Notice how they grouped them. Two, three, three, and two. Uh, I'll teach someday on that. I'm not... It's a long story. First five do with our relationship to God. Last five do with our relationship to man. Say, wait a minute. What's, what's number five, by the way? Honor your father and mother. Well, wait a minute. No, no, no. That goes in the last test because that has to do with our relationship with man. No, God said in the Jews, said, the way we treat our parents directly affects our relationship to God. Interesting. I can teach a long time on that, but I won't take the time tonight. 
Interesting. Let's go on. I think I got an inset there. See? Ten Commandments. Um, we also have up there on that mountain. That's what we've got in the next slide. Uh, whoops, I didn't show another one. Okay, here we are. Let's go to a different site. Go to a different site. And I got a lot more I can teach on that, just just brief. A uh, different site, this uh, kind of leads us back to uh, one of our projects called the Tefak Project. Tefak El Tefak. Okay, that's all Hebrew. Okay, I'm not saying bad words or anything. It's Hebrew. Uh, it means hand breath by hand breath. And we, we've got lots of projects. We've got projects. We want every one of God's children involved if possible. You with me? And we've got big donors and big donors with big checks and checkbooks. And honest truth, and I, I probably shouldn't tell this story everywhere I go, but I do because it just impacted my life so much. We had, well, actually it was back on the Ear David City of David project, you know, where we pull aside loam and all that was. Uh, they're getting ready to build the, the complex there, the gift shop and the restrooms and everything. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Had a donor come up and he wrote a check um, to donate to the project. And Rick called Moshe and said, I got this check here. The, the guy has one request. He, all, he, all he wants is his name on the front of the building somewhere. Moshe said, Rick, tear up the check. Give the man his money back. Because it's not about him. It's not about me, and it's not about you. And he said, I will not let any man get in the way of God's glory. So Rick had to tear up the check for $120 million. It's not the only time it's happened. It's the biggest one, but that's not the only time it's happened. Okay, we've had a couple of 30 millions and 15 million and, but you know what, it's, it's not about me. I'm just a, I'm just a sinner. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just a sinner. It's not about me, guys. And I hope you don't walk out here and I say, wow, you're so smart because I'm not smart. And don't say, oh, you're so awesome because I'm not. I hope you got here saying, man, God's awesome. This is one of our projects here called the Tefak Project. These, what you're looking at here, honest truth, these are the shepherd's fields of Bethlehem, where the shepherds were when our Messiah took on our human form. Christ came into this world where Christ was born, that area. Uh, we're saving the shepherd's fields of Bethlehem. Tefak means a handbreadth. Tefak el Tefak, by the way, it's the smallest in Jewish law, the smallest piece of property you can buy. Uh, you can't buy it. Uh, you can support it. And uh, it's an international law thing. Uh, but by hand breath, by hand breath, we're going to redeem the shepherd's fields. We want everybody to be involved, have a part in this. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit later how you can get involved in this. Uh, it's, it's a very nominal fee, but we, we made it cheap enough that everybody can have a part in this. And you can have a part in supporting, redeeming this area. And by the way, uh, Moshe has already saved this land more than once. When we first got there, there was a D9 high track. If you don't know anything about dozers, it's a big dozer. Okay, big, big dozer, sitting there ready to level this mountain. The building, air, construction of this area is, is, they're trying to build on top of this area. And we are trying to preserve it so God's people can go there, see this, touch it, and feel it the way it was back when the shepherds were there. And God said, guys, Messiah's been born right up here at the Tower of the Flock. Um, trying to preserve this for God's people. No buildings. We have to have restrooms somewhere. We'll get them as far away as we can, um, you know, logistically. We just want to build a promenade through there so people can stroll through there and enjoy God's beautiful land and what he, he's preserved. Uh, and then I think i got one more slide, and then I'll stop for a few minutes. And they still raise sheep in this area today. We do a lot of different things. This is just a glimpse of what we do. Our, our foundation, Israel, owns, controls a 1,000 acres on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Nobody since the time of Christ has owned that much land in Israel. We have uh, the Red Heifer site. We have the, just opened the Gilgal where Joshua crossed the Jordan. Remember the, the Ark of the Covenant? You know the story? Uh, the waters parted. They crossed the Jordan as Joshua was leading Israel into to conquer the Promised Land. The Gilgal, and then they took the Ark of the Covenant out and went up to the city of Jericho and the walls. Yeah? Uh, the Gilgal. We've got that. It's an archaeological site. We, we now control that. We're getting ready to open that for, for people to come see. Uh, we work with archaeologists from, from the south tip of Israel to the north tip of Israel. 
God's been amazingly good to us. I ask every day, God, why me? Why have you allowed me to be involved in this? And uh, I'm the least of the least, and, and God's been gracious enough to allow me to be a part. And we want my, my, my responsibility on the team, I'm the speaker for the team. Now we're starting to, we just started taking this stuff, some of this stuff public. We, we don't want it to be necessarily on TV. A lot of it will be on TV, is on TV. We want to take it to God's people. And by the way, we do lead tour trips. They're not open any tour trips over there. You have to be invited by a recommendation. We don't want just anybody there. We just want God's people there that love it. Now, when we open the sites, you know what? We want everybody there when we open some of these sites. We, we want every Christian to come to these sites and see them and, and glorify God. We want the Jews there. We hope they know come Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Many have, by the way. We want the Muslims to come there. I hope the Muslims come there and find Jesus Christ. Do you not? This is what we do, all for the glory of God. Bishop. Night at Upper Room Church, huh? Wow, praise God. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Man, just give the Lord praise for a minute. Amen. You know, you take any one of those sites and you plug it in to find the truth in the Bible that's been there in written form for us unchanged for all of these years. And we get giddy because we make a discovery. We get giddy because they find the steps where the man was born blind. All the guy wanted to do was to worship. He said his goal was not to be healed there. He'd have been killed even for getting in the pool. He wanted to go worship. So he went down as close as he could. If he went further, he'd have been thrown out. If he'd gotten in the pool, they'd have killed him. But he did everything every day he could to get as close as he could to being able to go worship just like any other person could go to. He was born dirty. He was born blind. He didn't qualify to worship God. <laughs> Everybody point right here or point at yourself. How many of us were born clean? I read in the beginning of the word back in Genesis that when Adam and Eve bore a son, that he was in the image of his father. Previously, man was made in the image of God. But after the fall, when they had kids, we got the sinful nature for mom and dad. There ain't one of us that was born clean. He, made a hat, he may have had some thing you could see. He was blind. But he wasn't anything special, any different than you or me. But Jesus made a way for him. And later he made a way for all of us so that we could go and worship, so that we could have a relationship with Abba Father, that we could have a relationship with our Creator. Jesus made a way. Seeing these slides, I'm reminded of just, it doesn't seem like 2,000 years ago. It seems like he maybe just came from there. Because seeing these sights, I can see Jesus walk and talk and sit and teach. And I can picture him hanging on the side of the hill for everybody to see. And I can see him rising again as Messiah, King, Conqueror. Come on, somebody. I just want to take a moment. If you'd bow your heads just for a second. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I'll tell you what, this whole thing is about preaching the gospel. And the good news is that Jesus Christ made a way to restore our relationship with God. He was born of a Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, gave his life, died, buried, and rose again. And there are witnesses. 
that he rose again and later ascended into heaven. He was the final sacrifice for us all. There are those in this room tonight that do not know God, that don't know Jesus, that don't have a relationship that they can go to with the very one that gave them breath. If you're one of those people tonight, I ask you, I implore you to consider seriously if you walked out of this place tonight and, God forbid, lost your life, where would your next breath be? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that's for those that know him. Because there's another place that was made for the devil and his angels. It's a place of eternal torment. We're not meant to go there, but we will. Because a loving and gracious God gave us a plan that we can follow, a plan of salvation, accepting the gift that Jesus gave us, and we can escape the punishment that we're due. If there are those of you tonight with, a, with every head bowed, every eye closed, and you'd like to know Jesus and you don't know him, would you just slip up your hand for a moment? Just show me your hands. Just wave at me. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Wave at me till I see you. I know that there are those in here tonight that need Jesus. There are those. I'll tell you, I'm going to beat everybody up for a minute. Because if honestly everybody in here knows Jesus, why didn't we bring a friend? I'm just sharing. We'll, uh, we'll have a moment here. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if there's a, if there's a moment here that you want to come up and privately learn, you want to talk about asking Jesus into your heart. We're here for you tonight. That's what this is all about. All right, y'all look up here at me a minute. The Spirit of the Lord is telling me that there's people in here tonight that aren't right with the Lord. They've backslidden, they've gotten away, and they need to have a right relationship with God. I'm just telling you we're up here. There's people around here. Grab your neighbor. Ask him, how do I get right with God? Come up here and find somebody up here. You know what I'm saying? You hear God speaking to you, your heart. I'd like to go ahead and, and uh, provide, a, provide a moment here that we can take up an offering for this ministry, if that's okay. You won't be offended by that, will you? Come on. If I can get the ushers to, uh, to get the baskets and bring them up here. I can tell you that uh, everything that you give, by the way, if you're going to write a check to this, um, you can write it to Digging Deep. Two words, Digging Deep. If you want to write to the church, you're welcome to do that too because they'll just replace it with a, with a church check. But uh, Digging Deep is the name of the ministry. How many of y'all appreciate what you've seen tonight? I know that it's not free to go around and do what the team does. And uh, I'd like to give an... If, if the ushers go ahead and come forward, please. If we could take a moment and, and, uh, and just give to them what we can give to the Lord for, for his work. And I, and I can, I can vouch for him. I mean, you've seen, you've seen his heart and their heart that truly they just want God to be glorified and that everything that's done is to bring the knowledge of Jesus to the world. So if, uh, like I said, if you got a, if you got a check, if you need to know million is spelled M I L L I O N. Those of you that are just beginning in the faith, thousand is T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. For those of you old saints that are crusty in the pew, you spell 10, T-E-N. I'm sorry. I sound like Pastor Steve up here, don't I, a little bit. That's a, what an honor. <laughs> Anyways, uh, ushers, please go ahead and pass it around. But please, please give as you can. Please give as you can, and we appreciate that. Um, while that's happening, I'd like to have Dr. Steve come up for just a moment and, uh, and share about how we can be involved on, on a couple different levels in the future. And I do know that we're going, to, um, we're going to be emphasizing some of these things again right after the first of the year. Uh, we're going to be sharing uh, a little bit more how you can be involved. But Dr. Steve, would you come up again, please? Right. Invariably, when I speak, people say, 
So what can we do to get involved? Uh, we've got a couple, actually three different avenues tonight that you can get involved in. And by the way, I just want to say, you know, at least at this point, none of us make a dime off of any of this. It all goes to the work in Israel. It helps pay some of my travel expenses. Appreciate that. That's awesome. I, I have four or four businesses at home uh, that I run to I work all week in construction, pay my way here and back and that kind of stuff. But uh, just that your hearts at ease. I, I pastored for 15 years. I know there's a lot of people out there just trying to make money, make a living off of what they call ministry. It's not what we do. We do have a few avenues, though, we want you to get involved in every dime. It seems like every time Moshe gets money, he's buying more land and preserving more sites. And, and honestly, I'm deeply grateful for the stuff he has preserved. It is a lot of stuff we can't talk about right now, but it's unthinkable what he has done that we would not have, nobody would have, if it weren't for this work and this foundation, by the way, just a small part of it. Uh, we have Tefak out, Tefak, I mentioned, handbreads by handbreads. I, I believe it's like $77 plus shipping and handling. You can get involved by a sponsor, we have to use the word sponsor, uh, a small portion of land in the shepherd's fields help redeem this area before they build on. We have one spot of this that I show a slide sometimes call it Boaz's wheat fields. It was the wheat fields where Ruth uh, went and wheat in Boaz, reaped wheat in Boaz's wheat fields. Uh, don't know exactly Boaz's plot. We don't know that. We know that, but it was certainly the right area. Uh, I had the rare privilege of reaping wheat in that field the old-fashioned Jewish way. It's amazing. Uh, I've got an awesome memories of that place, and I'm glad I do because that's all we've got is memories. It's all gone now. It's built on top of with buildings, with condos, houses. It's gone forever. Nobody else will have that privilege of reaping wheat there ever again. Um, it, it's heartbreaking. We've got areas here that are just uh, none in this picture here, just to the right of this picture where this picture is just to the right outside the camera's view. Uh, you'll, there's gravel, there's parking lots. Part of this is already lost to building. We're saving it as fast as we can, but we can't, we're not able to save all of it. Uh, we made this a project that everyone can get involved in, and it's called Tefok Al Tefok. Um, Barry's going to be back at our table. A couple of the ladies from our group will be back at the table. If you want to get involved, that's great. Um, makes great Christmas presents, by the way. What do you get, uh, Mom and Dad, that have everything? I bet they don't have one of these. And if they do, they can have two. It's okay. Um, no, seriously, we have people order. We had someone lay the other day were 30 of these for a family for Christmas. Okay. Uh, some people are able to do that. I'm not. She's not. So it's Tefok Al Tefok. I think in the next slide we actually have... Uh, picture of this is what the certificate you get in it really it's a first class certificate you can get frame uh hang on your wall with your name on it we need your name or the name of the person you want the certificate to go to uh, make it very nice so you'll always remember that connection you have to god's land um we also do uh tours over there i don't call them tours or trips i'm we're still looking for a good word pilgrimage might be a good word what we do is not like what anybody else ever does in israel uh most of the places we go Again, nobody else is there because it requires high clearance to get in. They are active archaeological digs, which you have to be with the archaeologist to get in, which we do, obviously. And uh, some of the sites, there's nobody else there because we own the land. We just plain own the site. And we're, they're not open in public yet, yet we take our groups there. We do all kinds of tours. I um, mean, if you want to go dig, we'll go dig. i uh, got a singles group going next November. Uh, we're going to do some cool stuff like scuba diving in the Red Sea. Um, we're going to go... Uh, uh, Moshe's planning uh, a car camel caravan ride through the desert on the Old Spice Trail at midnight. Okay, uh, we can do that. Um, we do just all kinds of cool and fun stuff. Yeah, we, we, we learn a lot. Your mind will probably shut down after the first day because you learn so much. Mine does. Okay, Moshe is absolutely amazing. Um, but we also have fun, too. We relax. We have a great time. We're not there just to learn, even though you learn. We're there to touch your heart for the Lord Jesus Christ and change your life forever. And that's what we do. And by the way, just a comparison. We actually just, just had, I, I can tell this story a hundred times over. No, Rick can tell a thousand times over. Uh, we just had a, a man uh, on one of our groups, and he used to book all the trips, set up all the trips for Benny Hinn. And he said, after the second day there, after the second day of a 12-day trip, he said, if, if I went home today, I could honestly say, I have done more to, in, in this trip, in two days, than all of our trips ever have done put together. 
and we hear it's true. Uh, we do more in one day than most do in two weeks. That's the honest truth. Not to mention we're doing stuff that nobody else gets to do. Uh, we get to see the real stuff in God's land. Um, so also we get involved that way. And don't worry when you're there. You're never far from home. But I do have to warn you, they have a few menu items that I'm not familiar with in, in America. The honest truth, they have a, a McFlawful, McSwarma, and a McSnistle. That's the honest truth. Thank you very much for being so kind this evening.